So, uh, so here's our man. Uh, here's Carl Rowe. Carl, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, it really, really appreciated. It's a, it's a treat. And uh, Jean Becker says big hello. So there we go. There we go. She invoked the magic name, Jean Becker. <laughs> but you were. I've you had were... a frantic morning. I hope you. Find it. I've had a frantic, mor frantic morning. I don't. I hope you don't mind. But in a minute, when the coffee finishes, I'm going to jump away and grab my cup of coffee. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, we also wanted to uh, say thanks for, um, hang on, there we go, I'm having technical issues here, there we go. Um, we just had a presentation from Professor Lawless on the Electoral College and how it works. I sent your bio out to the students last night, so, so I don't need to go through your um, credentials, but suffice it to say that you were the architect of the 2000 and 2004 um, victories and how, could you briefly explain sort of electoral college strategy in an actual campaign? We just did the theory, but can yeah. you talk about how it affected what you did? Well, as we approach 2000, uh, you, first of all, you have to consider what the, the political landscape looks like and you have to chart several paths to victory uh, because you don't want to just run the table, you know, in one, one way. You have to have several ways to get there. And so for us in 2000, uh, we had several groups of uh, battleground targets. Many of them were the then traditional battleground states, um, Ohio, uh, Florida, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Nevada, um, you know, the Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, to a lesser extent, Minnesota. But we also had to, um, grab some states in the West that had gone for Clinton-Gore uh, at least once. Um, uh, Nevada, Montana, and Arizona, all of which Clinton had taken at least one time. And we also thought we had a shot because of peculiar circumstances at the state of Oregon, uh, where we came up short, but we lost the state by, by about 5,000 votes in 2000. But we thought we had a shot because uh, the state had gone through a brief Republican renaissance. Three of five congressmen were Republicans. They had a Republican majority in the state house. They had two statewide elected officials. They recently won, it, won a U.S. Senate race. And um, we had um, Ralph Nader on the ballot and a lot of kooks and nuts in Portland and Eugene. Nothing ever changes. And uh, we thought we had a shot. Um, but the real puzzle was going to be we had to take four historically Democratic states, border states, Arkansas, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. Uh, and people think of them today in a different way than they were in 2000. Arkansas was the home state of the sitting Democratic president, William Jefferson Clinton. Uh, Tennessee was the home state of the Democratic nominee, Albert Gore. Uh, Kentucky was historically Democrat. And West Virginia had last voted for the Republican candidate in an open race for the presidency in 1928, when it took nominating a New York Catholic to bring out all the Methodist and Presbyterians and the hills and hollows of West Virginia in order to vote Republican. Bob Dole lost the state by a mere 16 points in, in 1996. But we had to win all four of them. And if we had not won all four of them, uh, Bush would not be president of the United States. So we were also looking at Maine and New Hampshire as possibilities. New Hampshire is a, a traditionally uh, a, a, a close state. It was, it's been since then relatively close. It had been close before. It's also a very difficult state to, to campaign in because it's way too expensive to buy all those liberals in Massachusetts when you buy Boston TV. So it is a real, you know, it's a real difficult state. You have to organize it's city by city, county by county, 13 counties and uh, lots of little cities and you got to organize it at a grassroots level. And then Maine, which since then has now broken out its electoral college vote by district, but, but uh, we, uh, we were hoping to take the whole state. But so that, that was sort of our bat, you know, and, and of course then we had states that were changing that uh, we knew were changing, but hope the Democrats wouldn't figure it out like North Carolina and Virginia. And thankfully they did not figure out either of those in 2000 or 2004 that there was change available there. But we had to have several different paths to get there. And why is this important? Because uh, back then, we're in a different climate today. Back then, uh, candidates had a limited amount of money for the general election. We had $89 million to spend uh, between the time of the Republican convention and the general election because we were accepting federal finances. Since, 19, since the 1976 presidential election, candidates uh, uh, availed themselves of public financing in the general election. This stopped in 2008 when 
Barack Obama decided he could raise more money than uh, than in, from uh, by foregoing federal financing, and every candidate since then has done so. But we had a limited number of dollars to spend, and so the, where those dollars went, and what the candidate did, and where you put the resources available at the party committee, those were all critical decisions that depended upon having you know several different paths to get to the electoral majority and uh, and an organization and a campaign strategy to to execute. So. Um, 2004 is a little bit simpler because we had, we sort of knew where we had to shore up uh, Ohio and Florida, and we knew where there was a real opportunity. We, we actually won, this is one of the dirty little secrets, we actually won New Mexico in 2000. Uh, there were, I, I want to say, 17 counties, primarily in the southeastern part of the state, which is called Little Texas. It's uh, the Permian Basin area, oil and gas producing. Uh, while, while, while like the rest of New Mexico, heavily Latino, it is very conservative because of the energy industry. And what we, we lost the state by, I want to say like 1,300 votes on election night. And the counties all had to then recount their vote because the election was so, so close. And in those 17 counties, one of those counties discovered that there was an air. We, uh, we discovered that in one of those counties, the Chavez County, Roswell, New Mexico, they discovered there was a bug in the software that was used by these 17 counties to tabulate their vote. And if you voted the straight re Republican ticket and then went down and voted for George W. Bush, it kicked out your vote. And if you voted for the Democratic ticket and then went down and marked for Al Gore, it kicked out your vote. Bush carried 15 of these 17 counties. So recounting Roswell and fixing the bug in one county, Chavez County, cut the lead from like 1,300 votes to 600 votes. And there were 14 more counties like that, that if we, if we filed a lawsuit and said, you got to recant, you got to fix the bug in the software, we in all likelihood would, would have carried New Mexico by a slim margin. But we were trying to say to Al Gore, don't file the lawsuit in Florida. So we couldn't be filing them in one place and filing in another. But New Mexico by 2004, it was clear it was a state that we could conceivably win. And we went back after Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, Oregon, uh, which we had won, uh, which we'd lost, and New Hampshire, which we had won, and Maine, which we had come close to but had lost. Um, we went back at those in, in, in 2004, and we, we, we lost New Hampshire, but we, we, had, uh, we, we, we picked up New Mexico, offset it with New Mexico, and ended up with more electoral college votes in 04 than we did in 00 as a result. Uh, we kept Nevada, which was uh, also in the Republican column both those years, and Colorado, which was voted both times for Bush. So, um, you know, these things change. The Electoral College changes because America is an ever-changing country. So what is a uh, battleground state this election may not be a battleground state in an election or two. Witness Texas. Texas was a battleground state in 1980. I was the young punk running the Texans for Reagan Bush Victory Committee in, a funeral, in, an, in an abandoned funeral parlor in downtown Austin. And we were a battleground there, but shortly thereafter, we weren't a battleground for the next uh, you know, 30 years. Wow. With, with, uh, yeah, were, were you 78, weren't you on the Bush, uh, Bush for President campaign uh, early on before when he was? No, it, it, was, it was actually pre presidential campaign. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 it was actually 1977 that I went to work for, I'd worked for him in Washington and, and, yeah. uh, and I, he offered me a job running. These now are sophisticated the pre-presidential campaign, the thing you do before you become an official candidate. But in 1977 and 78, it was a rather uh, small affair. Our principal spokesman was George H.W. Bush. Our chairman was a young Houston lawyer named James A. Baker III. Yeah. Our, our finance chairman was the president's, the future president's brother, Johnny Bush, who could tell the meanest, the, the funniest stories you've ever heard, most of them <laughs> unrepeatable in public. And for most of its 18 month existence, I was the staff. And wow. so, and so, and, and I went to work in uh, June of uh, May of uh, 77 and in March or April of 78, we hired a, an executive assistant. She, a couple yep. months later that a scheduler and on Labor Day of uh, 41 um, uh, young tennis partner from the Houston Country Club began oh, yeah. to travel with uh, David Quinton Bates. And yep. uh, it, was, it was all affair, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Back in the day. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to open the questions to the students in just a second, but um, uh, let me ask you this in general. If you were advising both campaigns right now, 
what would your advice be? At electoral college or otherwise, just in general, what would you? Well, well uh, Biden's got the upper hand and inaction will, will take that away. And uh, I'm shocked that it's taken him this long to make one definitive statement on violence in our cities. Mm -hmm. uh, that it, look, there's a majority in this country that believe simultaneously, and a big majority, that believe simultaneously two things. About in a, a Reuters Ipsos poll, which was the first one to come out and to delve into this, but it's been validated by others. About three out of every four Americans said that the protests uh, of following the death of George Floyd were justified. And nearly uh, four out of five, 79% said that any violence connected with those protests was unjustified and dishonored the memory of George Floyd. So there's a, there's a big majority in the country that say what we saw happen on our television screens in Minneapolis, St. Paul, was the death of that unfortunate man is worthy of going to the streets. But also saying the destruction of private property, destroying a, a business, or, or trying to burn down a public building, or destroying police vehicles, or killing people, or maiming people, or hurting people, is unjustified under any circumstances. We really are living in the shadow of the of the, of the philosophy of Martin Luther King of nonviolence. You know, Stokely Carmichael said, "Burn, baby, burn." Martin Luther King won that battle for the hearts and minds of the American people. But Biden, until this week, has been reluctant to criticize the violence. And the voters who want to vote for him, particularly the swing voters who are who are capable of voting for Donald Trump, but they don't vote for Biden and, and might vote for Trump instead of Biden if they don't hear more from him. They want to hear him denounce the senseless violence that we're seeing on, on, our, on our screens. You know, some guy being executed on the streets of Portland or, you know, and Joe Biden's got the ability to, to make this argument that the U.S. courthouse in Portland is named after Mark Hatfield, who was a close friend and colleague of Joe Biden's and a Republican. And for Biden to stand up and Say, I knew Mark Hatfield, who was a decent, compassionate soul, who opposed the Vietnam War, who opposed violence in all its forms, and who was my colleague and dear friend. And to burn down that building that bears his name is a travesty and an insult to the concept of justice in America. If he would say those kind of things, bam, this thing would be over. Uh, similarly, if the president would be a little bit more disciplined and stop tweeting, he's got two advantages that are available to him, one of which is he is the guy who says, I stand with the men and women in blue. I'm the first to condemn it. He gave a great speech in Florida the Saturday after George Floyd was killed on Monday, but nobody heard it because it was in combination with the space launch. But in that, he, he condemns the death, uh, uh, the murder of George Floyd, says, I want to be a friend to anyone who seeks justice, and, 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 and then hit the violence. But he did both things, the things that the, Re the Rips Reuters Ipsos poll suggested the American people believe. So he, he's, he, 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 can find the right tone on that, and if he should. But the biggest advantage he's got is that there's a sense that that he is the guy able to reignite the economy of the United States of America. And those two things, plus a defense of his handling of coronavirus, are the three most th important things that he needs to talk about in the here and now, plus talking about what he wants to do in the next four years. But, but you know, we got 61 days, and if you tweet about something that's inconsequential and it chews up a day, it's choosing up a big chunk of what time you have to share your message with the American people. We're getting up questions from students asking about um, your reaction to the fact that Donald Trump hasn't condemned explicitly violence among his own supporters. So the same way that Joe Biden hasn't been particularly vocal, Trump hasn't either. And I mean, yeah. is that part of a base strategy? What What's your reaction to that? Uh, I, I, I don't know why he doesn't do it. I thought the Wall Street Journal editorial this week was really good, which is, Mr. President, tell your people to stay away. Tell your, tell your supporters not to go to Portland. Tell them not. But I also, look, I think it was important. I, I, look, we saw in a way that we weren't otherwise going to see what happened in Kenosha by him going there. I mean, to see those burned out buildings. I mean, it looked like, you know, Berlin after World War II. It looked like London in the Blitz. And uh, so I thought that was useful. But yeah, he ought to, the, the person who's going to win this is the one who can appeal to that majority, that big majority that says this is justified, peaceful protest is justified, violence is not. And, and a good way for the president to do it is to do exactly what the Wall Street Journal editorial board said, and that is say, I, I don't want my supporters seeking confrontation with these violent people who are, who are ripping out the heart of great American cities. 
I, I have a question that sort of speaks to some of the questions that have been coming in from the students also, which is when you think about the way that electoral college strategies have evolved since 2000, how much of this is now a base strategy versus trying to win over that middle? So when you think about George Bush with compassionate conservatism, for example, it wasn't just about making sure that his own people got out in battleground states. Have yeah. you noticed a change, or is it just that we're perceiving that more because candidates are talking about it more? I think this is the moronic focus of the media. Nobody wins an election by appealing solely to their base. Neither party's base is big enough to win. You have to be able to reach outside your base. Trump did in 2016. Think about this. 37% of the American electorate said, I like him. I think he's qualified. I think he's got the right experience. He's an agent of change. Uh, and I'm voting for him. And 9% of the electorate said, I don't like him. I don't think he's qualified. I don't think he's got the right experience. But I hate her more than I hate him. So I'm voting for him. Now that's the 37% was his base. But he won because of the 46% who said, you know what, given the choice between these two, I'm going for him. And, you know, that, that's, that's at its crudest and most, uh, uh, you know, sort of negative form. But if you win a presidential election, you win a presidential election by solidifying your party's base and reaching outside of it. Look, Bush won re-election in 2004 with 44 percent of the Latino vote. Is that the Republican base? He erased the gender gap. The gender gap disappeared for, for the first time in many, many years. It disappeared. In the two, are women the base of the Republican Party? In, he got 8% of the African-American vote in 2000 and 13% in 2004. And in battleground states, 16% of the African-American vote. Is that the base of the Republican Party? No. We won in 2004, despite the fact that, that I mean, we got a quarter more people to vote for us in 2004 than we got to vote for us in 2000. It was by reaching outside the base of the Republican Party. Similarly, how did we win in 2000? West Virginia was not part of the Republican base. Coal miners and rednecks in West Virginia who were union members were not based in the Republican Party. So my, my point is this, it, neither party wins by a base only strategy. The advantage to Biden in this election is, as it is viewed as more of a traditional Democrat than a lunatic Democrat. So the voters that might not vote for Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren were, were saying and are saying today, excuse me, I'm capable of voting for Joe Biden because he He's more of a traditional Democrat, and I think with the country will be all right and we'll survive it. But neither party wins by a base strategy. And I, I love how the, you know, the press loves to write, well, you know, appealing to his base, you know, the base only strategy. I read those stories for two years in 2003 and four and vomited by the end of the election. But, you know, that's the way the media sometimes gets. They get in a narrative, they get in a meme, and they just follow through on it. Nobody. Oh, and I think now, and I think now with the 24 hour media uh, news cycle and constant internet, you know, people are now, regular voters are now talking about base strategies as well. So it's not just like in 2000 or 2004, we now, it's part of the vernacular. That's one of the great uh, damages wrought on our democratic system by social media is now everybody is a strategy. Everybody's an architect. <laughs> Guns of bitches, that's my title. <laughs> <laughs> right, why do you tee up the next question? I'm grabbing my coffee. Okay. <laughs> I, um, I have a um, question for him about election night that, um, let's see what he says. So I don't mean to make- The uh, machine is malfunctioned. What can oh, I say? Shoot. <laughs> well, um, while you're waiting, um, there are many people on this call, not the three of us, <laughs> who, who were not necessarily born in the year 2000. And um, there's been some, press this week about what could happen on election night uh, that was in uh, Bloomberg, I think it was, uh, that's getting a lot of attention. And uh, what many people on this call, other than the three of us, might not be aware of is that we did not have a winner on election night in 2000, and it went on for quite a while, and you were in the thick of it. And uh, what can you say to young people to assure them that if there is not a winner on election night this year, uh, that the Republic will survive. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is there anything you can yeah. give us some insight on that the, when the country's been through this before, how to go? Well, let, let me talk briefly. First of all, this is not the first time that it happened that we didn't know on election right. night who won. 1960. Uh, well, I'm going back to 1800. There you go. 
Thomas Jefferson, founder of the University of Virginia, the Electoral College ends in December of 1800 in a tie. And the election is not settled until the following February when uh, the, the Congress votes under the Constitution then, it was one vote per state. Uh, there were 16 states, you needed uh, nine votes, nine of the 16 states in order to win. And they begin voting, I, I wanna say on February 17th at noon. Uh, and, it, and it ends inconclusively because uh, nobody has a majority. Jefferson is now being opposed by his running mate, Aaron Burr, who's attempting to steal the presidency away from his chief. Uh, and so it is, uh, Jefferson has eight states in his, in his camp and Burr has most of the rest with a couple of states deadlocked. Maryland is deadlocked because it is a blinding snowstorm in Washington, D.C. The entire capital is covered in a blizzard. Uh, Maryland is four Democrats and four Federalists. One of the Democrats is ill, John Nicholson. He insists upon, his wife thinks he's going to die, but he insists upon being carried on a stretcher two miles through the, through the snowbound streets of Washington, D.C. in order to, to be installed in a committee room off the House floor so that he can deadlock the Maryland delegation. Now this goes on, they vote every hour on the hour for the next 25 hours. And there's a wonderful diary notation about how in the middle of the night, they sent for their sleeping caps and their sleeping blankets and their nightcaps so that they can fall asleep in chairs and on tables uh, arrayed around the House of Representatives chamber and be awakened every hour. This goes on for, for a day and, it, and it's deadlocked. So they settle down and say, let's vote once a day and see if we can't find our way out of it. A week later, the impasse is broken by Alexander Hamilton, who hates Jefferson. But he writes George Baird, the Federalist Congressman, the sole Congressman from Delaware, and says, I hate Jefferson, but at least he has character. And when given the choice of two evils, go for the lesser every time. So Baird throws out, uh, takes his leave, thereby uh, removing one vote from Burr, convinces his fellow Federalist Congressman from Vermont, they have two Congressmen from Vermont, he, con he convinces the Federalists to walk out as well, leaving the state's vote in the hands of, of, of the Democrat. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, Thomas Jefferson is elected president of the United States and is sworn into office two weeks later. Now, Florida was bad because we had 36 days. Can you imagine the country not knowing from November until two weeks before in that time, it was the 4th of March, who the president of the United States was going to be. Now, we're, we're not going to face that exactly this time, but, but we are going to face some delays. There's going to be a piece tomorrow in the Wall Street Journal. I commend it to you. I've read it. I think it is incredibly well researched, brilliantly written, very insightful. I think I've done a hell of a job with it myself. <laughs> but I'm writing on this exact topic for the, for the journal tomorrow. And right. we're, we're going to impose this on us. And, and, and the two states that I I'm going to watch an election like, look, first of all, let's be honest, New York and California are going to screw it up. They, you know, California just makes a habit of screwing it up. New York has stumbled its way into, into screwing it up. It took them two months to announce the results of the Democratic primary. Now, why? Two reasons. First of all, well, three reasons. They, they, they had an explosion of votes. In the city of New York, four years ago, there were 50,000 votes cast in the New York Democratic primary. This time around, they said mail-in ballots, and there were 750,000. Now, you need to have machines, procedures, policies in place to handle that kind of a volume. There were 1.7 million mail-in ballots in New York uh, compared to several hundred thousand four years ago. So that's a huge volume, eight times as many. So you don't have the people, the procedures, the equipment, all safeguards, none of that. That's why it took so long. This, the, but there are two problems that are going to be endemic to a number of states. First of all, when do the ballots have to be returned? Most of the states that we're talking about, the battleground states, require the ballots to be returned by the 3rd of November. But some states, one state allows it until the 20th. Many, one state allows it to the 6th, one to the 9th. Uh, several of them, three of them, I believe it is, allow it till the 10th, one week after the election for ballots to be received. That's going to be a problem. Here's the bigger problem. It is a complicated process to take that envelope that you get with the absentee ballot in it, compare the signature that's generally on the back flap uh, between the envelope uh, uh, and over the envelope and the uh, and the flap and compare it to what's on the voter registration files six states allow you to begin that process before election day 
Six of them, including Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, don't allow you to begin that process until election day itself. So if you're, if you're Florida, you can begin that process 22 days before. If you're, if you're Pennsylvania, you begin it that day. So if you've got 2 million ba ballots, how long do you think it's going to take to process, validate, and verify those ballots? So I'm, I'm sort of pointing people's attention to this problem so that we understand where it's going to be. But two of the biggest ones are going to be Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. Now, California is going to screw it up and New York is going to screw it up. But we're going to know where, that New York is going for Joe Biden and that California is going for Joe Biden. So it's just the question of what the margin is. But Pennsylvania, if it's close, Wisconsin, if it's close, let me pull my list out here. Iowa, if it's close, um, oh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong ones. Iowa, Maine, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, all of them are going to be problematic because they don't allow you to begin processing until election day. Now, but, but even if you get the ability to process early, the California, can, you can start 29 days before the election, but they're just so screwed up out there. They, 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 it, it takes them, you know, several days, if not a week or more to report the final election congressional races. I just want to anyway, uh, Wall Street uh, Journal. Stanford, so I, I love California. I feel like I need to give California a little bit of a, a little bit of credit. <laughs> yeah, but you don't live now. You, you, you went to school there, but you left as soon as you could, right? <laughs> Only because they wouldn't hire me. Um, <laughs> well, said something about their poor judgment in that matter as well. There you go. There you go. Um, I, I did note, though, yesterday, last night, I was watching a story on CNN about how in many of the states that you mentioned, they've actually seen a huge uptick on Amazon ordering literal, like the old school um, envelope openers, like in preparation. Oh, that's interesting. Gave me pause. Oh, like, God. that's where we really are as a country right now. We're trying to figure out how to have the hardware to open an envelope. There are, there are problems. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I used to be in the direct mail business. There are envelopes that slit that. There, there are machines that slit that envelope up. But, you know, they're made by German craftsmen. And you can't just sort of pick up the phone and say, send me, you know, 1,000 of them and I'll send you a distribution list of cities in New York State to send them to. It just doesn't work that way. But wow. just the physical process of, of, think about it. In New York City, they had to go from handling 50,000 ballots where you had to check the signature on the envelope against the official records to 750,000. I mean, no wonder it took them two months. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I hate to say this, but we are uh, out of time. And we have one closing question that we ask all our guests. Uh, if you could have a beer, cocktail, or a cup of coffee with an American political leader, dead or alive, who would it be? Uh, I'm tempted to say George Washington, but he wouldn't tell us anything. Uh, and uh, I think that's probably true. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, I, I should say William McKinley because I'm I'm, I'm a student of McKinley, but I, but I, but he'd be pleasant but boring. I think I'd I'd, I'd want to Abraham Lincoln, and I'd, nice. I'd, want, I'd want the Lincoln of 1864, early 1865, to Great. you know pick his brain about how he got from where he was to where he was. And uh, what a remarkable figure this uh, George Washington didn't know w what to do because he was the first guy. But Abraham Lincoln faced such an awful task, such a, you know, an, an enormous, uh, you know, and, and, he, and he also had to grow. I mean, it's hard to grow in an office where you're being where there's so many demands placed on you. But thank God he did. He moved from, a, you know, a, somebody whose initial goal was save the union, even if it meant that uh, slavery would continue for a period to a man who came to understand that the only way that the, the, the war could be won and the war would be ended by was by the swift expiration of slavery. And he had the courage and guts to, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation and he had the courage and guts to see it through. And you know, to preside, there's a reason why he goes from a relatively um, you know, smooth face in 1860 to deep crevices in his, in his, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in his cheeks and on his forehead. A man had to preside over a war with 600,000 of his fellow Americans killed each other, and yeah. uh, no man should have to bear that price. No. Yeah. Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you. And a that's common one. We had journalists last week who really wanted to have drinks with Abraham Lincoln too. Maybe we can. What do you mean common? I mean, it's maybe <laughs> it's an uncommon <laughs> way of expressing it. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I'm, so so Jen picked Geraldine Ferraro, and I picked uh, to put my hat on. I always have my hat on my desk. Forty-one. I don't know if you can see it. George Bush 41. There we go. Thank love, you. Love to still have a beer can with I, him. I, yeah. 
can I tell you, can I tell you a funny uh, 41 story before we Absolutely. go? Absolutely, yes. Let me, let me grab one, one, let me grab one thing. <laughs> That's a pretty fancy dog bed. That is. Although mine's in an actual bed, so I think she would find that not acceptable. Oh, that would be a step down. So, <laughs> so I went to work for George H.W. Bush when I was 22 years old. I met him for 10 minutes. 10 minutes. He did not know me. I met him for 10 minutes. And five weeks later, his chief of staff called me and said, uh, would you like to go to work for him as his special assistant? So he'd been he and his son have been a big part of my life so they called me up and said gene becker our mutual friend called me and mm -hmm. said he's it's the time is coming he wants to see you will you come down and see him so i drove down raised the time went down to see him she said come in the afternoon he's better in the afternoon just before dinner and we had a wonderful visit and it got a chance to say goodbye and uh, yeah. really really rem remarkable and uh during the course, we're sitting in his library and he says, uh, Carl, you, you want a book? I said, what do you mean, Mr. President? He said, my library. Nobody wants my library. I've tried to give it to my own library and they don't want it. And I've tried to give it to a and They don't want it. You want a book? I said, yes, Mr. President. I'd love to have a book. And I thought he'd say, well, go pick one out. He said, well, I want to think about it. I want to think about it. So we went on to other things. And uh, finished uh, the visit. I walked out, got in my car and wept for about 40 minutes outside and uh, he passed. <clears throat> and a week later, a package arrives and in it is this book, Our Presidents by James Morgan. It's dreadful. It's absolutely terrible. It is <laughs> stories about various presidents and they're just, they're just dreadful. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. I, I mean, it's just dreadful. I can't, I can't tell you how bad the book is, but it is, it is, it was published in the year of his birth, of 41's birth. And inside is an inscription to George for your 90th, uh, for your 90th uh, book, another year of uh, uh, a book written in the year of your birth. Enjoy reading about our predecessors who had their own challenges. Bill, 612-14. This is Bill Clinton's 90th birthday present to President Bush. And he sort of, he picked that one out and said, send it to Rove after I'm gone. Pretty wow. neat. Wow, that's quite a story. Isn't that great? That. That, that, that's Thanks awesome. for having me. Everybody get on to your next class. Yeah, thank you for- thank Thank you, for you very much. Great fun. Okay. Thank you, you bet.